My name's Adrian Jackson from EPCC. Uh, I'm talking about the KNL system we're getting which is in the middle of being installed on Archer at the moment, but actually quite a lot of this material I'm talking about has come from other people. Uh, so Harvey Richardson from Korea has provided quite a lot of this material. And uh, in fact, actually, if you were at the Archer Champions Workshop where he gave a presentation on the KNL stuff, a reasonable amount of the that material came from there. And um, uh, there's also slides in here from Intel's public material on the KNL, mainly because I'm too lazy to uh, redraw pictures. Um, and also some of the benchmarking data I'll talk about at the end uh, has come from uh, other people, EPCC. Uh, uh, a lot of it's come from Fiona Reed, actually, EPCC. So this, this virtual tutorial is a follow on from one we gave about a month ago now, uh, in September, just introducing KNL in general uh, and talking about the processor and the kind of performance you might expect on it. The idea today was that we were going to introduce um, more specific details about how you use the Archer KNL system. So Archer integrated into a Cray uh, environment and attached to, uh, sorry, KNL integrated into a Cray environment and attached to Archer. Uh, actually, my hope or our hope was the system would have been up and working for user access around and about now. So people would have been able to come to this tutorial and then pretty much get straight onto the system and, and play around with it. The timescale has slipped uh, slightly, so we're now expecting um, user access in the middle of next week, probably middle to end of next week. You know, that may change as time goes on, but that's that's the current expectation. It's just um, as these things do integrate in new hardware into a system, it takes a little bit longer than usual. Um, so I will be recapping a bit of the stuff we talked about in the first lecture and then providing details on the specifics of how we will use it in, 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 the, in the Archer system and talking a little bit about performance at the end. But if, if people have questions at any point, please do let me know, um, shout out with them. Uh, and if any of the other experts here, because I know, I know Harvey's here from Cray, um, want to chip in at any point, then please feel free to do so. So we're talking about the KNL. Hopefully you can see my slide, which says uh, Xeon Finite's landing. It has some pretty pictures of processors. Um, this is the reason we're getting a new uh, system on Archer is to enable people to port their codes to this new processor from Intel and evaluate performance. So the Knight's landing is a Xeon Phi processor, the second generation of Xeon Phi. It's the successor to the Knight's Corner, or also known as a KNC, uh, but it has some interesting new features uh, we talked about last time. So it's got new memory systems, new communication networks, faster cores. All in all, it should provide uh, quite improved performance of the previous generation of the Xeon Phi, more usability, and actually a, uh, a reasonable alternative to other many core solutions. Um, so it, trying to compete in the GPU space a bit, uh, but the original Xeon Phi had quite a, f a number of performance limitations, which we've seen disappear from the system. So whether, whether that's in how you access it, uh, the original Xeon Phi, the KNC was a co-processor, so you had to uh, run a normal processor and the KNC alongside it and transfer, da transfer data backwards and forwards. With this new post of the KNL, you have access to main memory, so you don't have that burden of having to move data to and from the coprocessor. Um, the original KNC was uh, limited in the sort of way you could use it, so you had to use multiple threads on each physical core to get any reasonable compute performance from it. That limitation has now gone here. So um uh the specifications and, and the way it's been made this process and our experience of it is is that we have much um, improved performance over the first generation um however the real purpose of this virtual tutorial is to sort of detail what's happening in terms of archer so archer's uh, getting a 12 kml test system so this is not a large scale big many thousand core system uh, many thousand processor system but it's uh, a reasonable 
test and uh, development system which will enable people to come along and see if their port could ports well, ports easily to KNL and what kind of performance they get. So only 12 processors, it's actually 12 nodes because each node has a single processor in it. But even with that, you still get somewhere in the order of seven, 700 cores across the system. Uh, and more importantly, it gives us a chance to run tests on sort of multiple KNLs at once. So a, a lot of the benchmarking people have done up till now has been on single KNLs. How does a code port to a single KNL? What this test system will let us do is see how your code port when using multiple KNLs, how does the communication network between these work? Uh, what kind of performance uh, trade-offs do we see on MPI versus hybrid and, and all these kind of questions? Uh, and actually it's quite interesting from my perspective because um, there are a number of KNL systems out there where the, the multiple KNLs integrated using Omnipath, so Intel's network or InfiniBand or stuff like that. Here with this test system, because it create the KNL processes uh, and nodes that contain them are connected together using the Cray network, the Cray Aries network. So they're actually connected together using the same network that the Archer nodes are. Um, so it's quite nice to see what, you know, it's a high performance network, what kind of characteristics uh, that has. So each, we've got 12 nodes, each has a single KNL processor in it. It's the 7210 versions, which are 64 core KNLs. So we've got 64 physical cores in them. Each can run four threads, uh, four hyper threads. So can, each can run four threads efficiently, which means uh, you can sensibly run up to 256 things inside each node. That's not to say you necessarily have to, to get good performance or want to, but the processor supports were in, say, 256 threads um, or 266, 256 processes in the node. Um, each processor also has uh, this fast, no, I shouldn't say fast, fast is the wrong word, I always get this wrong, high bandwidth. Each processor has this high bandwidth memory attached to it. So this is called the MCD RAM, 16 gigabytes of MCD RAM. As we discussed last time, this is stacked on top of a processor. Um, and then it also has access to main memory. So there's 96 gigabytes of main memory uh, associated with the system as well. And that's standard DDR4. In fact, actually, that's probably slightly faster memory than we have in Archer. But I could be making that up. I don't remember off the top of my head what the, the memory spec for Archer is. Um, we're expecting, as I said, the system to be live for users next week, hopefully. The plan is in the first month, uh, people can get access and it won't cost them anything in terms of uh, Archer budgets. And then after the first month, uh, any use of the KNL will be budgeted using uh, time from your standard Archer budget. Um, Sorry, Adrian. That's okay. Can I just interrupt? Of course, yeah. There are separate budgets for the KNL system and for the standard Archer system. Okay. So the usage will come off as an, a, a, a separate budget. All Archer users will be able to request that. And is there a transfer possible between these budgets or are they strictly separate things? They're currently strictly separate, though um, there is a discussion uh, next week with EPSRC about access mechanisms and things may change, but at the moment they are separate. Okay, thanks, Alan. Okay, so um, first thing to uh, discuss, as I said, we can run up to 256 threads or processes sensibly on the KNL. Uh, first thing to point out is the way that this is done in the hardware. So uh, the KNL cores are numbered, uh, physical cores are numbered in a sensible way, zero up to 63. So we have um, 64 physical cores, but each one of those can run four hyper threads. So they also has a, have, a, have a, a numbering. So we can run uh, zero to 60, 63 of a physical cause and then um, 
ID 64 to 127 is, is the uh, first set of hyper threads, and then 128 to um, et cetera, et cetera, are the next set of hyper threads. What, so that means that if you want to run more than one thing per core, this should let you uh, pin your MPI processes and your whatever it is, your threads, your OpenMP threads, these kind of things sensibly to the to the hardware. So when you run a, an MPI job and you're running uh, 64 MPI processes on a KNL, that should just give you the first, all the physical cores with one MPI process per physical core. Then if you run any more things on top of that, that should wrap around and start using the hyper threads on each of the cores um, sensibly. So this means that if you run a standard MPI job, it should do something which you would like it to do on the system. So it shouldn't, it's not going to put the four, first four MPI processes on the first physical core and the second four MPI process on the second, something like that. It should um, sensibly uh, wrap them around. Hi, Adrian, it's Harvey. Can I make a point here? Of course you can, Harvey, yep. So, so just be aware that this numbering is the numbering as seen from the OS. So this is what the OS calls a CPU. So if you look at proc CPU info or you use some command that refers to CPUs, then this is the numbering we're talking about. Yes, so um, it's slightly complicated because there is a physical core number as well underneath, which is slightly different as well. But in terms of how you interact with it with the job submission system and the job launch, uh, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, but this is what it sees, Harvey, right? So it, it, it sees the further physical cores as the first zero to 63 numbered things and then beyond that it goes into the hyper threads that's right and my understanding is that's what what happens so that's what happens on archer at the moment so normal archer processes we have 24 cores in a node but we also have hyper threads so there's 48 slots in a node um, and on archer they're numbered zero to 23 for the physical cores and then 24 to 47 for the hyper threads and that, that's fine. If, you, if you were attempting to, to do a specific binding using app run to particular CPUs, then this is the numbering scheme that's run. Yeah. Okay. Um, and then the nice thing um, about the integration with the Cray system is that we uh, can use the, the scheduling system, so the PBS, and the job launcher, which is AP run, as you would in on Archer. So you should be able to use a standard PBS script. There may be some tweaks to this to select particular modes of using the, uh, the KNLs uh, and the standard AP run. So you should be able to write a normal but, uh, batch submission script. You may have to change your budget in it, as Alan uh, outlined. You may have a separate budget. And then you could just run a, use a normal AP run command, and that should take your application and spawn it properly on a node. So this example here, AP run minus N64, my app, should just take my application, it's an MPI application, and run it on the first uh, 64 physical cores inside the KNL. So in terms of the running setup, there should not be that much that's different from uh, Arch. Now, there is a slight health warning here that the system is still being integrated. So there are some of these things which may change slightly between now and when, we, when users get access. I don't expect anything on this slide to change. Some of the stuff I'm talking about uh, slightly late in May, um, but we have, uh, as I'll say later, we've got a place where we're putting documentation up on the Archer website, which will outline exactly uh, what the final setup will be. Um, because we're using the standard AP run system, then if you're wanting to do the hyper thread, and if you're wanting to use more than 64 processes or threads per processor, per KNL, then you can use the standard AP run um, control to do this. So we can use the minus D flag to specify how many threads a process will spawn. And we can use the minus J flag to enable hyper threading uh, on the processes. So uh, for those of you who have used Arch um, in quite a lot, you may know that the AP run command, it looks at the number of nodes you've requested with you when you've launched your job. And then it, it looks at the number of processes you want to run. So in this case, say I'm saying I want to run 64 processes and the number of threads I want to run. And it says, does that match the number of resources you requested? 
Uh, and if it doesn't, it says you've, you've tried to run something which is bigger than the number of processes you've got access to, I can't do that. And that's where this minus J flag comes in here. So the minus J4 here in this first uh, command here says, um, turn on hyper threading and enable four threads per physical process. So when I do the AP run thing, it will know that each physical processor has 256 virtual slots it can use for scheduling. Uh, now, we've not had access to play the system yet, but I expect the default to be minus J1, and Harvey will correct me if I'm wrong here, which means when you run an AP run command, it would expect to put 64 things per KNL, um, not 128 or 256. So if you want to oversubscribe the physical cores, you need to use this minus J command when you do the AP run. Um, you don't necessarily have to use a minus D and the minus CC flags here to control how threads are bound to physical um, cores or bound to uh, API processes. You can use the OMP proc bind and um, you can use the OMP proc bind environment variable instead, which will say, uh, bind e any threads that I generate to the MPI pro to the core, the MPI process uh, that generated it. So these two AP run commands should do exactly the same thing. They're just using slightly different syntax. Um, so uh, yes, okay, right. So this, I can see there's some questions going on in the uh, in the chat here. Um, there is. I'm going to talk about what the, the file system setup uh, and, and the login nodes setup is uh, slightly dated down the line. So if you can hold off for that, um, the details will be com come in, but shout at me if you want me to tell you it now. Uh, in fact, let me just, because there's been questions here, let me just skip to that and then we can come back and talk about all the memory modes and, and that kind of stuff because uh, this is maybe less interesting. Um, Oh, yeah, I've... oh, okay. Yes, okay, here we go. So how do you how do you get access to the KNL? The the plan is that when it goes live, you'll need to sign up for an account. You do that through our Archer Safe place. So there will be a button which says KNL access from a menu in Safe. So if you go into a login account details page on Safe, where and there'll be a button up for a particular login account which says give me KNL access to this account. When you press that button, that will go trigger a process of creating the, the account. Um, you will also be, uh, as Alan was mentioning, you'll be given a, a special budget for the KNL. So they'll, you'll take your account and join it to the K01 project. So you'll get a budget called K01 your username. Um, which will be given a default, uh, as far as I know, and Alan will correct me if I'm wrong, will be given a default quarter of uh, 30 killer AUs. Um, I've not yet calculated, actually, I've not gone through the process of calculating what, how many KNL node hours um, a killer AU will equate to, but I'm sure that will be up with the documentation um, very shortly. The there will be, I haven't put it on this slide because we don't know the full details yet, but there will be separate login nodes for the KNL um, cluster. Uh, and those log login nodes is where you will submit your jobs to the batch system from. So there'll be a separate login node. That login node will not be accessible from the outside world. So what you'll have to do is first log into Archer as normal and then from there SSH into the login node. Now the exact name of that login nodes have not been uh, set yet. So I can't say, you know, this is exactly what you log into, but you'll say SSH and KNL login, and that will get you onto a login nodes where you can uh, submit jobs and, and compile from. Um, the, in terms of the file systems on von login nodes, uh, home will be cross mounted. So you'll get your same home directories from Archer. Uh, but there will be a new work directory just for the KNL. So it will be a, a sort of uh, scratch workspace, um, which is actually a, a file system five. You don't need to worry about that. There'll be a slash work, which is accessible from the KNLs 
and from the login nodes for the KNLs um, where you can uh, write your data. Um, so. Can I just interrupt, please? Oh, Alan, yeah, please do. I was just, you, you commented, it's, we, we're, we are indeed giving people 30 kill AUs. That corresponds to about 85 KNL node hours. Thank you. Thank you. Um, there will, there, again as well, there will be special queues for the KNL. So it has its own batch system. Um, there will be limits on that. Uh, Alan maybe know them better than me. So I seem to remember that there was something like an hour limit on the longest job we can run. Uh, Alan will correct me. I mean, these haven't all been set up yet. So, but it's because it's designed for a test system. Uh, we're not looking for enabling large scale production runs. There's only 12 KLs. We want to share them out between people. So it's likely there'll be a, a restricted uh, queue setup compared to uh, normal Archer jobs. Um, is there anything you want to add to that, Alan? Uh, no, I, I think I think I think the, the the challenge is we're not a hundred percent sure on things. I think we people just have to recognise we're trying to give whatever information uh, we currently have. That's fine. So, uh, in terms of uh, how do we program for the KNL? Well, um, we should have the full uh, the, the we should have a reasonable compiler set up uh, for KNL. It, it's designed so you can use MPI and OpenMP. Uh, MKL is built for it. Uh, any other kind of threading library that you want to use should map fine to the KNL. When you get onto the new login nodes of the system, there'll be a new module you can load. So, uh, CREPE MIC KNL, uh, this line here, module load, CREPE MIC KNL. I would expect when we're up and running, this will be loaded for you by default. But what this does is it sets up the compilers to make sure that they build an executable for the Xeon 5 processor. Um, and effectively what it does is for the Intel, it, it does a, a number of things, but for the Intel compilers, it adds this flag in here, this minus X MIC dash AV X 512. Uh, for create compilers, it's this minus H CPU equals MIC dash KNL. Um, it's unclear to me yet whether the GNU compilers will be up and running at the beginning or not. Uh, so the latest GNU compilers do have KNL support in them, uh, but it requires a new, uh, possibly a newer version of, of uh, GNU compilers than, than we are currently running on the main system. So we will wait and see when that comes. Basically, definitely have the Cray and Intel compilers, and they will be set up to build executables for the KNL by default. Um, as long as this module create MIC KNL is set up. So you shouldn't yourself have to include any of these compiler flags to, to run on the, on the KNLs. It should just build it from there. If you wanted to build your executables on the normal login nodes and on the Archer login nodes by itself, um, then you may be able to use the compilers there and use these flags, but they are different versions of the compilers. So some of the compilers may not be uh, up to speed uh, with the configurations you need for KNL. Or, or for instance, if you want to build your executable on a different system and port it over these are flags you, you might want to use. Um, there's a, there is a slight issue building on the KNL. Because those flags are included by default, they mean the executable um, is built to use vector instructions which are only uh, compatible on the KNL. So you build a uh, executable in that way, it will run on the KNL, but it won't necessarily run on other Intel processors because it may be using floating point vector instructions, which are not there. The reverse isn't true. So if I built an executable on the normal Archer nodes and port it across to the KNL, it should run because uh, the KNL is a new enough processor to know about all the older vector instructions from, from the standard either bridge or um, Archer processors, but I couldn't take an executable from the KNL system and move it back onto Archer because it, it, it has the wrong kind of instructions there. For most people, this doesn't matter. However, if your build process does some building, some things, and then runs some, some, runs some of those executables, for instance, to do some auto-tuning in the build process or something like that, um, 
you may have a problem that your build process fails because it tries to compile something, then tries to run it, and it can't run that on the login nodes because we don't have the correct instruction sets. Um, so for instance, we've seen applications like CP2K do this. They, they want to compile up a, a library that do some auto-tuning of that library whilst they compile it, and so they try and run it, and it doesn't work. There are ways around this. So if you're using the Intel compilers, you can build what's called a fat binary. So that basically says, actually build me two versions of my executable, one which will run on KNL and one which will run on normal processors, and then decide at runtime which processor we're running on and use the correct one. And you can do that with this flag minus uh, AX, MIC AVX 512, AVX. If you're not using the Intel compiler, so if you're going to be using Cray compilers or if the GNU compilers are there, and, and you know, then what you would need to do is manually specify a different processor for the build. So you'd have to specify, actually, during my build process, I want to build for a generic processor. And once I've done all that build process, I can go back and build optimized uh, binaries for the KNL itself. Okay. Now, this part is very much still uh, under configuration. So this part may change between now and next week. We've not uh, discussed it. I've just, just skipped over it for the time being. Uh, but for those of you who are here for the last virtual tutorial we gave or um, know about KNLs anyway, you'll know that there are different what's called uh, cluster options, which are ways the KNL cores um, network is set up and different memory modes, so the different ways this MCD RAM, this high bandwidth memory, can be configured. Um, so you, there are different applications which may want to run the KNL processor in different ways. So some applications might want to use this high bandwidth memory in cache mode, some might want to use it in flat mode. I'll go back and talk about what these actually mean for those people who have not heard that before. The interesting thing uh, is that unfortunately, these different configurations can only be selected at boot time. So you need, to, if you want to change your pros, your KNL processor between a flat mode and cache mode, or quadrant mode and and all to all mode, don't worry if you don't know what those means. If you want to do that, you need to reboot the, the nodes because that that setting is done at, at through the BIOS at, at uh, boot time. Uh, the PBS system, the batch system we're going to use on the on these nodes, is set up to is has a functionality to do this. Um, so you can, if you can see these lines here, hash PBS dash L select equals four colon AOE equals quad underscore one hundred. So this AOE stuff at the end here is new, and this is a way of saying. This is a resource configuration that I need for my job. So here I'm saying, the first line is saying, I want to get four KNL nodes, but those nodes need to be set up in quadrant mode uh, with 100% of the high bandwidth memory set up in cache mode. And the one below it is saying, uh, I want four nodes, but they're set up in um, SNC2 uh, node, so um, with 50% of the memory as high bandwidth cache and 50% of the memory is high bandwidth um, flat, okay? Uh, so this AOE string here can accept uh, any of the following um, bits. So it can be the, the, the node configuration, the cluster configuration, this quad of this SNC2 bit, SNC2 bit can either be A to A, so that's an all to all configuration, SNC2, SNC4, hemisphere, and quadrant, so hem and quad. And I'll go back and talk about what they actually mean. Um, and then for the end bit, the which specifies how much of the high bandwidth memory is cache, you can have zero, 25, 50, and 100. So if I wanted to run a, a job with all my high bandwidth memories in flat mode, which means I have to manage it myself, I have to allocate and deallocate data there myself, and I want to use the quadrant network configuration, then I would say AOE equals quad underscore zero. So this can be used in two ways. 
Uh, one is, this is you specifying exactly what hardware you want. And the batch with system will go and look at what hardware, how the hardware is currently configured, and it will schedule your job to the nodes which match your configuration. The other thing it can do, if you configure the batch system in this way, is it can say, okay, you've requested a job in this mode. None of these nodes are yet configured like that. So what I will do is reboot a node or reboot four nodes in this case to set up a KNL process in the specific ways you're asking. Uh, so the batch system can do that for you. Unfortunately, uh, the reboot time is not quick. So I've not measured this yet, uh, but from talking to people, the reboot time on, on nodes, uh, whether it's a Cray node or, or any of the Intel systems I've seen, is more ordered, uh, more of a time of 10, 20 minutes than 10 or 15 seconds. So we're in discussions at the moment with systems team, um, Archer systems team um, and um, configuration people about what exactly will go on here. So we don't yet know exactly how, what the support will be for this. The batch system lets you specify the resources you need and also has the potential to configure the nodes exactly how you asked it to. Whether this will be enabled initially on the kernel system we have, or whether we'll just have a node set up in the predefined configurations. And if you need something else, then we'll have to go through the help desk and, and ask for that kind of thing is, is still in, uh, up for discussion, but by the time user access comes around, this will be defined and, and we will um, put that in the documentation and, and update people on that. So I can hear that there are um, questions coming up. So, so Mark. Um, okay, so that's a good question. I, does, this mean one, does this mean one cannot guarantee the mode when a node is assigned to your job? I don't know yet. My, my expectation is the least will happen is that you specify the mode. If you specify the mode using this AOE command, um, then your job will not run until there are nodes in that mode. So you can imagine this being in a held state on a queue system. So if you specify, I want all to all and 100% MCD RAM cache, and there are no nodes like that, then the, 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 the base thing that I would imagine will happen is it will sit there and wait and do nothing. Whether we go through the process of saying, okay, anybody can ask for any mode, and, and that means rebooting the nodes when they ask for it, is still um, going to be decided. Um, the other thing you can do is you can request nodes without specifying this, and then when you're on the node, you can query what state that um, the node is. So there's a number of different ways you can say, what, how much MCD RAM cache do I have? How much, uh, what, what, what's my, my network set up like? So in the first instance though, I wouldn't worry too much about this because actually from the experimentation we've done and from most of the work people have done, there's lots of ways you can configure the KNL, but not all of them are massively interesting for most people. So in the first instance, if we had half the nodes set up in quadrant mode with the memory in flat configuration and half of them set up in quadrant mode, memory in 100% cache configuration, I think that would satisfy, you know, 80, 90% of what users wanted to do in this testing system. And then we could look further down the line at what other kinds of uh, configurations people would like. But I am slightly overstepping the mark here because this is yet to be decided and and uh, will be will be done over the, the next. So Adrian, I, I think you're correct. If if you request a mode that's not currently available, then your job will wait until a node's been reconfigured. The, the scenario I don't yet know is if you request a node that's about to become available because it's currently in use, then I don't know if you would cause a reconfiguration of something that was free, or your job would wait until the currently running job that, that was on that node would finish. So that scenario I don't know. But on the systems I use, they don't have PBS, but they have other resource managers. The general scenario is that you would wait until a node was reconfigured and you'd get the one you asked for. You wouldn't get something without that configuration. No, absolutely. Absolutely. I mean, the, the, the sort of other case is what happens if you don't ask for anything. And then, you know, again, we still have to see what happens here. Whether you, whether, whether you would ever get 
uh, jobs in a mixed state or not is, is, a, is another question. So, so we'll, they're all interesting questions and we will address this in the documentation uh, exactly once, once the PBS configuration is, is done and, um, and fixed. And I think that's another good point you made, which is it sounds like there's an enormous space of potential configurations, which is true. But I think in practice, the, the numbers of those configurations that you routinely want to use is quite small. Yeah. OK. So um, I will rewind slightly just to uh, for those of uh, who are mystified by all that talk of memory modes and uh, communication modes, what, what are we talking about here? So um, ANL has these different memory levels. We have the high bandwidth MCD RAM on the chip, and we also have main memory. So main memory is just normal. It's just like you have an Archer. You've got your whether it's 64 gigabytes on Archer node and, and cores can use that. On the KNL, we have 96 gigabytes per node and the cores can use that. Um, we would see similar latency and bandwidth as you see from standard processors. Um, we would expect, um, you know, modular the fact that you have more cores connect into the same, uh, to, to, to the uh, same, it's a similar size of memory, uh, but also some of the uh, communication configuration modes we'll talk about in a little bit may affect that may, that uh, latency and bandwidth. The the more interesting one is the MCD RAM. So this is high bandwidth on chip, the 16 gigabytes, which is reasonably big, but probably not big enough for large scale simulations to work with. And this is where the interesting questions come in because 16 gigabytes is big, but uh, you have access to 96 of gigabytes of main memory. And most applications, when you're running in, in uh, full production mode, you probably want more than 16 gigabytes for, for, of, uh, of memory for your data. So you'll need to use, you'll definitely use, you'll use the main memory. But the question is, how can you use this high bandwidth memory efficiently and to benefit your applications? The interesting thing about it as well is that it's high bandwidth memory, but it's actually slightly higher latency memory as well. So that means an individual memory access costs you a little bit more than going to, to normal memory, say 10 or 15 percent slower. Not, it's, not, it's not so massive, it's not an order of magnitude difference, but there is a uh, performance difference there, basically because, because the, the memory is stacked on chip, there's a, bit of, uh, there's a bit more extra logic inside the processor to decide exactly where the memory is um, assigned and uh, access it. Um, but uh, so individual memory accesses may be slightly slower, but it's high bandwidth. So if you are doing large uh, sort of scale streaming style applications, you should get much better performance from this because it can serve the data much faster. It can serve large chunks of the data more quickly than the, than the main memory. Uh, as I've already talked about, uh, you can have this in different configurations. So there's a cache mode, which where you don't see the MCD RAM from your application, it just acts as a uh, transparent cache to the main memory. Okay, so this is done in hardware. You don't have to touch this from your application. It's just all done for you. You don't have to worry about changing your program at all. You'll, you'll, um, you will just get the benefits of a high bandwidth memory automatically um, by data being loaded through it from cache, from, so from main memory and stored back to it through it. So and it's a pretty straightforward thing to do. Um, you can configure it, as has already been mentioned, in, in uh, so that 100% of the MCD RAM is cached. So it's all cached and sits in front of your main memory. Or you can say, I want half of it to be cached or a quarter of it to be cached. So you can have it as 25% cache, 50% cache, or 100% cache. Um, the the, um, off the, the, the other way of doing it is you say, I want it in flat mode. And that says, OK, the MCD RAM is now a separate memory space, a separate memory address range. And the application can use it, but you have to change your application at some way, in some way to be able to access this memory. So you have to be able to allocate and deallocate data directly in that in that space that gives you much more control about which data sets which 
structures, which variables you store in the MCD RAM and in, in normal memory, um, but uh, you have to change your application to use that. And then we have this, this way of, of doing hybrid stuff. So we can say um, that the 25% um, of my MCD RAM is cache, and then 75% of it is, is available for the, the uh, memory for the application to use directly okay um i'm simplifying slightly we'll see a bit more of the details um just out of interest uh so so uh, intel have been providing this graph for a while um this is just designed actually to show that for, for a range of applications or benchmarks actually the cache mode does quite well so not for everything but for a lot of uh, initial performance work the cache mode can can uh, give you benefits and you don't have to change your application. We can see that for a lot of that workloads, actually, once your the amount of work, data you're working on gets uh, larger and larger, uh, the cache performance does tail off a bit. And there will be some applications where cache load isn't what you want to do because you run data from main memory into MCD RAM and then to the, the processor. It actually takes, you know, you, you take that there's a slight performance hit of loading that data initially. Um, if you're not reusing it inside that cache, then it will be slower than if you were just using normal main memory. Anyway, so um, how can you uh, use this uh, MCD RAM if it's in flat mode? Well, uh, there's there's a quite simple way actually to to play around with it. So there's this program called NUMA Control, so NUMA CTL. Um, and actually, this works, um, lets you assign um, sort of allocates and deallocates of an application or let you assign an, applica memories applica an application's memory space to different NUMA regions on a processor. Um, so if I, this example here on the slides, I've, I've, I've looked at the hardware setup of my uh, KNL system here, and I can see for this KNL node, I've got around 96 gigabytes of main memory in, in node zero, and node one, I've got 16 gigabytes, and that's the MCD RAM. So I'm set up in flat, flat mode here, 100% flat mode. The application needs to manage both these memory spaces separately. Fortunately, this NUMA control thing lets you do that for a whole application. So it actually says you can set the bulk memory policy of an application and say, actually, force all my allocates and deallocates, force all my memory usage to go into one of these NUMA nodes or the other. So if I say AP run minus N64 and then NUMA control, so that's the application that's gonna force the memory binding. And then I do this minus M1 or double, double minus mem bind one, that will take cast step in this instance and it'll say do make sure all your allocations happen in that MCD RAM. And actually if I use this Minus M or membind flag, it says force you to do all your allocations and deallocations in, in MCD RAM. And if you run out of that 16 gigabytes, well, tough, your application will seg fault and it will die. Um, if you're trying to run a larger data set than that, well, you can use this minus P flag or minus preferred flag, which says actually do all my allocations in the MCD RAM. So this is uh, node one. Uh, but if you run out of memory there, then fall back to a fall back to uh, the other memory space, so go into main memory. So this is useful for taking your application in the first instance, um, and you're running on a KNL in flat mode and just saying, what performance benefit does running my application with MCD RAM give me? You know, provided your data set fits in that 16 gigabytes, you can just do a quick test. How does the MCD RAM affect the performance of the application? Does it make it better? Does it make it worse? Does it do nothing at all? This is, I don't think, what you want to do long term in terms of development and, and long term uh, application use, but it lets you get an initial flavor of it. And actually, if the sort of uh, membind one works for you, gives you good performance, then it's probably a good, in, a reasonable indication that the cache mode of a KNL memory is probably going to give you quite good performance. Yeah, or it's a sensible place to start. If you want to, go beyond that and manually control this memory, then there are different ways of doing this. So there is a library, a couple of libraries out there, Memkind and High Bandwidth Malloc, 
uh, which are standalone pieces of software, but which is sort of Intel's preferred way of doing uh, allocation and deallocation of the MCD RAM. And they provide you with uh, a new malloc function for C, so high bandwidth malloc, HBW underscore malloc for C. Um, there is also a standard container um, for C++. Um, and Intel, because malloc is not part of Fortran necessarily, Intel have also provided a, a specific attribute, uh, bang dir dollar attributes fast man, which says uh, anything, uh, this variable A, when you allocate it, allocate it in the high bandwidth memory. Um, fast mem is a is not a very nice name, but this is what Intel have chosen. So you can get the similar kind of functionality using the Intel compiler using this fast mem thing. Uh, there is a slight caveat to this that uh, automatic variables in, in Fortran are, are, in automa are automatically allocated in the DDR mode, DDR memory, the main memory. So there may be some memory. Um, management which you're not currently doing which you'd have to do to get best use of your MCD RAM for applications. Uh, another thing you can do, so for the Cray system, for the uh, Archer system, this Memkind uh, software will be installed for you in the module. So module load Cray-Memkind will give you access to this. So you don't have to download and install it yourself, it will just be there and you can just uh, link against it. And actually, if you, if you type man, you should be able to type mem mankind or mem high band, sorry, man mankind or man high bandwidth mallet on the login nodes, and that should describe, you know, give you a documentation for it. Um, if you're doing, if you want to do manual memory configuration using a similar kind of thing from Fortran, um, we have also written a, a wrapper of this library. So, uh, uh, Fortran interface to this library, which you can also call. Now, most people won't want to do this because um, most people don't use malloc inside their Fortran, but I have worked with codes before where they call malloc from inside Fortran to uh, manage memory. Um, so you can also do a, a similar kind of thing for high bandwidth malloc. And actually, um, quite nicely, Cray also have a set of directives to try and address this. We're actually uh, a bit more functional than the the Intel one. So the Intel fast mem directive, which I just showed you, only really works for, or only works for allocatable arrays. Whereas uh, Cray, for the Cray com uh, compiler, uh, they have a memory directive, which can work for uh, other kinds of uh, memory as well. So um, uh, it's maybe easier if I just show you with a, an example, but here we have an integer array uh, which is uh, an allocatable integer array A, I have an integer array B, which is a static, um, uh, statically defined uh, integer array. And we can see these high bandwidth um, memory directives, memory uh, brackets bandwidth here can work in both places. Um, and actually, so in the first instance, if you use bang dir dollar memory brackets bandwidth, that will say force this to go into the MCD RAM. Uh, if actually you try and allocate something which is too big for the MCD RAM, that would fail. Your, your program would fail at that allocate or that memory creation. It would just uh, run out of memory and it would take fault. Uh, the, the Cray directives are a bit more um, functional than that. So you can actually put a fallback attribute in there as well. So you can say, Try and allocate this in the high bandwidth memory, but if I run out, fall back into main memory so the program doesn't crash, it just uses a different memory space. So if you're using the Cray compiler, or if you can use the Cray compiler, there's quite nice Fortran functionality there to enable you to directly uh, map your memory usage to either main memory or the high bandwidth memory as required by your application. Of course, this only is uh, applicable in flat mode or in hybrid mode where you have some access to the high bandwidth memory directly from your application. Is there anything you want to add there, Harvey? No, that's fine. That's good. Cool. So the other thing you can configure in, in KNL is this uh, 
cluster mode of this quadrant network or effectively um, the, the KNL is set up with these 72 cores. I mean, not all of them are enabled for the KNLs we have, so only 64 of the cores are enabled on the KNLs we'll be using. But it's still set up in these 72 cores, which are on what we call tiles. Each tile has two cores on it, so there's 36 tiles. And they are connected together by this mesh interconnect. And then how... Um, data is mapped to memory is stored on this mesh interconnect okay and intel uh, let you configure this so you can have it in what's called all to all mode we can have it in quadrant or hemisphere mode or we can have it in sub numa clustering mode um, we don't need to worry in the first instance too much about this but it's really to do with how you match a memory lookup to a memory location and how much that costs you in, in, in when you're looking up data and when you're loading and storing data. And the ones that really are of interest to us, I think, are quadrant mode, where effectively it splits up the chip into four sections and it tries to uh, store the lookup table for the memory in the same section the memory is actually accessed from. Okay. And that should give you quite low latency and higher bandwidth than if you don't do any of this splitting up the chip. It should just, uh, if you, the, the, there is a mode called all to all where every uh, directory entry is just scattered across the whole chip. And that's quite, um, for, 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 for most applications, we'd expect it not to give you good performance. We expect the quadrant mode for most applications to give you a reasonably sensible bandwidth and latency um, but there is uh, what's called a sub numa clustering node where it actually specifically restricts um, memory accesses to, to quadrants of a system in, in, in sub numa clustering mode 4 or to half of a system in sub numa clustering mode 2. Um, so uh, the SNC2 and the SNC4 modes, these subclustering modes, may actually give you even higher memory um, lookup, sort of latency and bandwidth performance than the quadrant mode. The only problem is that your application really has to be quite good at doing NUMA allocations and, all and deallocations. So it has to be configured in such a way that it uses the memory which is local to its cores already. Uh, so if you if on something like Archer you're already doing this kind of programming where you take into account that actually on Archer we've got 64 gigabytes per node but 32 gigabytes is attached to one processor and 32 gigabytes is attached to another so if you access the memory which is attached to your local processor from a core it's faster than accessing the memory which is attached to the other processor if your application already takes that into account when it's doing its allocations and deallocations. Um, and, and most MPI applications should do this, right? It just is sort of what you get from MPI by default, unless you do something quite um, strange. Um, then, then in that case, you the, the subnuma clustering mode may give you a better performance than the quadrant mode. So, so Andrew, I mean, this is, yes. So I was just going to say, there, there was a question that asked how you would craft appropriate binding for the SNC4 mode. And I think the answer is too complicated to answer in this webinar, but we do know how to do that. So there's a combination of APRON options you could use. Similarly, we could craft some process binding using OpenMP variables. And, and we'd have to do that in a way that would work both for the CCE and the Intel compiler, and it's more complicated if you're doing threading, if you do OpenMP and MPI. So I think that's a recipe we'll try and publish in some form quite early on, but that's something we'll do. Thanks, Harvey. I mean, I think the thing to take away from this is that there are different ways you can use a processor, but in reality, for your first port, for your performance investigation initially, quadrant mode probably makes most sense for most applications. Once you've looked at quadrant mode, you may be interested in looking at SNC4 to see actually does that give us a slight 
performance improvement by reducing the latency, increasing the bandwidth I have access to memory, or is my application not quite ready for that? And if it's not, is there anything I could do to, to optimize it to, to, to get that? But I think for most instances, Quadrant's the way to go, and the SNC stuff may be a bit more interesting beyond that. So it's, sort of, it's a performance optimization step later down the line. I think that's right. If you, if you do SNC4 and get it wrong, you know, if, if you have OpenMP and you have variables allocated in the wrong place and you access them from different parts of it, that could be detri very detrimental. So it, it's going to need more skill and awareness of what you're doing to get a sensible result out of that mode than the other. But potentially, and there may be some benefit. The, the other thing that's worth mentioning at this point is that um, quadrant mode, you should be able to run one MPI process and then uh, as many threads as you want and get reasonable performance. If you go to SNC4 or SNC2, you have to be careful about, um, so to get good performance in SNC4, you'd want to run one MPI process per quadrant um, and uh, really, or you have to play with this memory binding thing because otherwise you don't get access to all the MCD RAM and uh, and these kind of things. So the quadrant, the, the, the SNC form, the SNC2 is a bit more, uh, yeah, a bit more advanced and you just have to be a little bit more careful with performance. And I think that, that was another good point you raised, which is, so questions like, what's a sensible mix of MPI processes to threads if you have a hybrid application? So if you're doing communication, then you want at least a few MPI processes to drive the communication. So uh, we're going to work on some recipe that's a kind of approach to KNL that will consider some of those things. What's the practical, sensible things you should do with these configurations of MCD RAM and how you can launch your application and what, what mix of hybrid you might pick. So hopefully that will give some good advice and approach to take. Cool. So that's something we'll be looking at. Um, so we've been through the how you program and compile for it. We think we know the ways you, you're going to use PBX, but there'll be more data coming on that down the line. Um, you know, some, there's some, as we've already really discuss, discussed here, um, when, when, when you port into it, then there's some codes, pure MPI across the KNL, and just using 64 MPI processes seem to work quite well. For other codes, uh, running in hybrid and using the hyper thread seems to be a um, sensible thing. So it's a question of playing, as how I said, playing a bit with the configuration and uh, um, seeing what you want to do. If you're, um, in hybrid mode, um, there is probably a minimum number of MPI processes you want to get access to the memory and network bandwidth, as, as Harvey's already mentioned. Uh, that's probably four, maybe uh, one per quadrant. But it, you know, this this may change from application to application. If you are going to run hybrid uh, programs on the KNL, you do need to be aware that the serial performance is still slower than, say, on the uh, the normal multi-core chip. So um, you need to have good hybrid, basically. So you need to make sure that, your, for, that there's as little serial parts of your hybrid implementation as possible. Otherwise, you'll take some performance hit through the processor itself, just being a bit slower than a, a normal multi-core process. Um, I wouldn't, you know, cache mode is probably a good way to start for most people. Um, and if it's not giving you good performance, then flat mode um, and, and then add in a bit of this MCD RAM management in your application is not a, is not a bad um, way to go. As with, with any modern processor nowadays, vectorization is key for performance. Um, the KNLs have very wide vector units. So I think each, K, each KNL core has two um 512 bit vector units so you have to be able to do reasonable vectorization to get good performance however ve the vector instruction set they're using is quite um improved over the previous knl okay and is on five so the knc so actually we see reasonably good vector performance just taking a normal code and porting it to the knl we don't see what we saw for the older xeon fives where you really saw uh, massive performance problems if you had various vectorization patterns. As I said, we should you should be able, once it's up and running, there'll be an email that goes out, but you should be able to get access through the safe by requesting it. Um, the KNLs will have their own login nodes, so you'll SSH into Arch and then SSH into the login nodes themselves. 
um, use PBS there and we'll compile the jobs on those login nodes because they're set up to do it. Although, yeah, because that's the sensible thing to do. I mean, I did mention before you maybe could compile on the normal nodes and, and copy it across and things, but there may be differences between the MPI library versions we're using on the KNL system and, and on normal Archer. So if, if at all uh, possible, compiling on the KNL login nodes themselves is probably the way to go. Um, we uh, will have a, a one day training course uh, on using this system at the beginning, the fir 1st of November in Edinburgh. Um, so we're going to run some more courses later in, uh, so uh, early next year, possibly later this year, early next year, definitely. Uh, two day porting and optimization courses for KNL. In the first instance, we've got a one day course coming up 1st of November. That's open for registration now. Documentation will go up online at uh, documentation slash KNL dash guide. And because this is an Archer system, uh, it will be integrated in the SAE. It's also supported by our help desk as normal. So if you have questions, problems, issues, then the help desk can be your first port of call to get um, you know, advice or uh, help with these things. And, and as ever, you know, we hope there'll be no uh, teething problems, but uh, if you're on the system and have questions or things are not working as you expect, just get in touch with us and, and let us know what's, what's going on. I think we will aim to do another one of these virtual tutorials, uh, a, a quicker one than this one, a brief one, once the system is actually up and running and say, look, now the configuration is nailed down. This is the name of the login node. This is exactly the PBS um, format we're going to use. And we'll, uh, we'll do that, um, yeah, I'm hoping next week, hopefully, possibly the week after, but we'll try and get that out as, as soon as we have um, sensible access to a system which is uh, configured in the way it's going to be for users. Um, so at that point, is there any questions? Has anybody got any outstanding questions? Um, It's, uh, if you don't, that's not a problem. Um, I Some brief performance numbers I thought I would talk through. Um, they, some of these we talked about last week, but we've been playing with uh, single KNLs um, for a, a, a few months now. So, uh, and comparing them to Archer, which is an ivory system, and to Broadwell, which is a much newer processor and, and, and much more directly comparable to the KNL in terms of, of performance and cost. Um, and for a range of applications, so there's three applications here that I did some tests on recently. Uh, CASTEP, which is most people will know materials modeling code. GS2 is a plasma physics code. COSER is a, a fluid dynamics code, a CFD code. Um, and it's just been interesting for us to see what's the performance like compared to Archer and, you know, does the high bandwidth memory give us benefits or, or not? So we can see for CASTEP, for instance, that you know, first port optimization, the KNL uh, performance is about 50% slower than Archer and a lot slower than the new Broadwell processors. And actually, the high bandwidth memory doesn't seem to be helping us there. So, there's a, you know, it's a really interesting question to see we're working on now and what's going on there. I mean, it, you know, we're using 64 MPI processors on the KNL compared to 24 on, on, on Archer on the Ivy Bridge or 36 on the Broadwell. So there's a, maybe a bit of MPI overhead going on there. But you know, it'd be interesting to, for us to work out why the MC DRAM is not helping and, and also why it's not scaling quite so well. So we're looking at that at the moment. But an application like GS2, we can see that we port it to the KNL. And it, again, it goes about 50% slower than, than Archer and the Ivy Bridge system. But if we, if we then use the MCD RAM, and this is just doing the bulk NUMA control policy setting and just force it to use MCD RAM. Actually, we can see we start to get performance which is faster than Archer. So 100 seconds rather than 126. Uh, not, still not quite as good as the Broadwell system we have access to, where it's 83 seconds, but you know, comparable. And, and there's maybe some things we can do to look pushing that performance a little bit further. Um, and likewise, on Cursor, we see a similar kind of thing. KNL, 561 seconds versus Archer, 
497 seconds. The cursor is slower on KNL than Arch, not 50%, but it is slower. And then we use a high bandwidth memory, and that gives us some performance benefits, and it gets us to go faster than Arch. And again, we're still not quite as fast as the Broadwell processor. So, uh, but we, you know, we're still we're in a reasonable. Um, we're not too far away from it, but we're not as fast as it. Interestingly, we've also started to look at multi KNL performance. So this, the, the, the number we had on the last slide, we talked a bit about the last virtual tutorial. Here we've now started to say, well, how do we scale on um, uh, if we use two KNLs instead of one KNL? And so for Cursor, we can see on Arch, a single node, it's about 500 seconds. On a KNL with high bandwidth memory, it's about 450 seconds. If I go to two KNLs using high bandwidth memory, suddenly I'm down to 200 seconds. Okay, I have not had time to put the Archer two node number here, but we can see that maybe part of a benefit with the KNL, maybe this we get higher performance when scaling to larger processor accounts because we get access to more MCD RAM, because we get access to more memory bandwidth, just like you do on, a, on an Archer node. When you add more Archer nodes, you get more memory bandwidth, but we've got more MCD RAM bandwidth here as well. So maybe the KNL will uh, we'll start to see performance benefits, which are a bit over and above what we see in the parallelizations that go along in um, Archer in general. And so GS2 with a similar kind of same thing. When we go to two nodes with a high bandwidth memory, well, now it's not going quite as fast. So it's now gone from 103 seconds down to 70 seconds. Uh, it's faster than one Broadwell node, but not as fast as we saw closer going. So what's going on there? You know, maybe maybe the MCD RAM is not being used as efficiently now. So there's there's some interesting questions um, as to uh, that kind of thing. Um, yes. So cast up. So I, I should I should um, uh, I should say that. CASTEP is, is, is complicated in terms of performance because CASTEP does lots of, uh, lots of different things. So when I say CASTEP, really, I should say CASTEP doing this and this and this, rather than just CASTEP uh, as itself. But yes, uh, I'm quite happy to, to talk through these numbers here. Um, they're quite interesting. Um, but it's just, it's just nice. I think that's the thing that this new KXC40 system we get with Arch will let us do. You know, not just play the single KNL, but what does KNL look like with uh, large bandwidth, uh, there's a low latency, high bandwidth network connected to it as well. And, and what kind of effects do we start to see going multi-nodal um, on these things here? And uh, also from my perspective, so I went through these last time, uh, but the, the, the MPI performance is better on the KNL, but it's still not brilliant. Uh, but we do start to see these are Fiona's numbers here. We do start to see um, things like the MCD RAM, the, the high bandwidth memory, giving us some um, potentially, well, giving us some performance benefits when we go to to uh, high. Uh, when we, yes, when we use the high bandwidth memories, it may give us some benefits for the MPI uh, communication. But here, it's interesting that when we were running some tests, cache mode didn't give you the same performance benefits as as using it in flat mode, which is maybe uh, understandable because in cache mode you need to load it both through the the DRAM and DRAM. But that's only coming into play once you're up to large message sizes. Um, yes. What MPI is that? This is Intel MPI. So I think this would be an interesting area to look at because I know that the Cray MPT developers have spent some time on MPI because clearly there's a lot of potentially a lot of MPI ranks you can place on the one node now. So it would be interesting to do some comparisons of these again. Yeah, so uh, that's why I'm, I'm hoping I'll get um, two, two or three weeks uh, exclusive access to this uh, KNL test system. <laughs> Well, that's not going to happen, of course. But yes, I think there's some interesting stuff. I am. It would be really nice as well to compare the different MPI libraries and the different networks that we that we can get access to with the KNLs and see what goes on here. Because, um, but you know, there are also issues to do with the performance of the MPI library itself on the KNL and, and the message uh, queues and all these kind of things. But we can see that 
we, this multi-level memory system also sort of starts to come into play and, and uh, gives us interesting performance when we're doing large large messages inside a KNL. We can start to see some of some of these things come into play. So hopefully in the next uh, couple of months we'll get some uh, really nice um, performance uh, su suggestions and uh, benchmarking data from from places like uh, Harvey the uh, Career Centre of Excellence and um, some of the work we're doing at EPC and other people are doing. Uh, but it's quite nice that we have a KNL system coming on the ground that we, we can play with these things in a bit more detail. Um, and with that, I should say we have